so great to be together this morning. We're here to worship the Lord and we're here to sing to Him and praise Him. So let's do that together. Let's worship Him this morning. Savior. 
simple truth this morning that you love us God you see the depths of who we are and Lord despite our past despite what we may have done Jesus you still love us and I thank you for your grace and your mercy that we can call upon you and ask for forgiveness Lord you love us so much that you don't leave us where we are you don't leave us in our shame and our guilt but Jesus, when we run to you, there is freedom and there is life. God, I pray that you would help us to love others in the way that you love us. I pray that we would find joy in obeying you and not just being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. I pray that we would draw our strength from you, that you would give us boldness to love well, to represent Christ. Pray that we wouldn't hide it in our hearts, but Jesus, that we would shine bright for you so that others may come to know you. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Oh, come. 
take a seat. Well, hey, church family, I'm Josh, and I'm standing here today with the founder of The Family Restored, Eric Gerard, and we are so excited. We're in their new building, and we are partnering with them as our Joyful Giving recipient. So Eric, tell us just a little bit about the mission um, and vision of what you guys do here. Our mission is to strengthen and support families affected by addiction. We do that through our family support groups. We do have one here at East Point. Yeah, that's awesome. We have a pretty large scholarship fund that helps pay for people to enter treatment. We operate a men's recovery home in Portland as well. Why is this so important to you? So as someone in long-term recovery myself, I fully understand that it was my family who was affected by my addiction the most. They did absolutely everything they could to try to help me, to try to fix me, to ultimately keep me alive. It wasn't until they started attending family support groups and seeking help for themselves first that it really changed the way that they approached me and my behavior. And in the end, ultimately, put me in a position where I became more interested in recovery. Oh, well, that's amazing. And we actually have a story today that we're gonna share of uh, someone just in our church family too that have been affected by the family restored. So let's check that out. I was always able to manipulate my family and get what I wanted. In the last intervention, you know, I really thought it was gonna be just like every time before. I didn't believe them when they gave me these consequences because I was always able to to get by them. And this time it wasn't working. I would reach out, I would text, I would call, and and I would just not get the response I was looking for. I was helpless, I was hopeless, and it was a gift, a gift of desperation. Had it not been for my mother coming to, to the meetings and learning how to hold those lines and keep those boundaries, I don't believe that I would be in recovery today. It would have been just like every time before. When I finally came to a place where I realized Tracy had a problem with drugs and alcohol, my husband and I tried everything. And I remember just having this sense of gloom and doom every day because I didn't know what to do for her. I just didn't have any hope. The lack of hope for me was attributed to the fact that I didn't know how to operate from where I sat. After we did the intervention, I was encouraged to go to this meeting, and that's how I was introduced to the Family Restored. I finally found the hope that I was looking for. I was told there to just hold to the consequences that we had set. Every week when I left, the facilitator would just say, hold the line, Patty, just hold the line. And I would remember that every time that she texted or called. From there, I started to feel stronger and more hopeful, and I would hear the stories of other people that had been where I was, and from the addicts and alcoholics that were facilitating the meetings, explaining how they had taken advantage of their family and manipulated and all the things that happened with addiction. From that point on, I was hopeful for the first time in many, many years. And I'm so, so grateful. What my life looks like today, I work back in the family business. I go back to the detox where I went to share my experience and strength and my hope. I facilitate a mother's meeting now to help moms that are in treatment, in rehab, that are struggling with the guilt and the shame of being an addict or an alcoholic in recovery. And I help facilitate the family support meeting now for the family restored. Look at me. I can tell you from where I sit, having Tracy facilitating this family support meeting is nothing short of a miracle from God. I've seen it not only help me, but so many other families. The fact that she is clean and sober and able to come and give back to the meeting that helped me so much is just... I have no words. Well, it's amazing what The Family Restored has been able to accomplish already. Um, and you actually just got the keys to this building and this place. So tell us, what's the vision uh, moving forward in here? We're super excited to have a place that we can call home where we can really welcome people in from the community, 
and have a place where people can come to receive our services and get the support that they need. Early recovery is a really crucial time for anyone trying to get well from addiction. And so we hope to support people and really allow them to come receive our services and focus their energy on getting themselves well, physically, mentally, spiritually, so that they can have a better foundation moving forward. That's awesome. Well, I mean, I know life throws so much at us that can distract us. So if they can just focus on that one thing and their families and partner with them, it's incredible. So thanks for all the work that you do. And uh, thanks church for, for giving in this uh, season of joyful giving. We're excited to see you guys thrive. Amen. There's nothing like hearing Tracy and Patty talk about that. Talk about going from hopelessness and helplessness to hopefulness and helpfulness. And Jesus is all about decimating despair. And that's what he does for us. And that's why we're partnering with Family Restore. Because that's, that's what they're all about. Taking despair away, incinerating it up. But they do it in a way that's so interesting because how many haven't had family members that have put them in a place of, I just don't know what to do. How am I going to get through this? Consequently, you end up coming to loggerheads with the one who's having the issue. And here, all of that is just gone. They help each other out to the point where Tracy's actually leading these groups. Uh, just praise God for that. And uh, so that motivated us. And we want to just see that flourish continually. And so during this uh, month of joyful giving, we are going to give 10% of all our offerings away to see uh, Family Restore thrive. And we look forward to that and all the people that they can help. Because it's very much like the church, right? We're supposed to come around one another and help each other out. And that's what they're doing there. So we love what they're doing there. Um, one other thing as well is there's a tree out there with a few more tags on it for about 150 kids that we're helping out as we partnered through uh, with uh, the root cellar. So if you go out there, do it in an orderly fashion. We don't want to have any fights out in front of the tree. So, so do that. Grab those, and there'll be instructions on that as well. There's a number of ways to give at East Point. You can give online. You can even uh, scan that QR code on the back of the chair. Um, you can give in the giving boxes in the back as well. Let, us, let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for your power and how we see that working through so many places and different organizations and then through individuals. And that's what it all comes down to, Father. And they just think of all the freedom that's going to take place through Family Restore. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing more and more fruit in that, Father. So bless this offering. Let it just be multiplied for their cause, in Jesus' name, amen. Is it worth it? The challenge of it, the fear and even the pain that it brings. It is a journey full of lessons and failures and requires courage. It is not easy. In fact, it will be our greatest challenge. But the quest is worth it. Take strength knowing that you are not alone. Press on towards the goal, making sure to plant your feet on solid ground. Our God is not a boring God. He invites us on the adventure of a lifetime. Amen. Good morning, church family. How are we today? All right. Hey, just real quick, I just want everybody to just take a look around. Just look behind you, look around you. Is it not great to be a part of this church family? Is it not fun to be a part of a church family that gets to worship, gets to usher in the Christmas season here at East Point? And I'll tell you, we are keeping Christ at the center of Christmas. Some people might say, oh, why? Why are you doing that? We believe we are doing that. And we believe in Jesus, that he came as God in flesh to dwell among us, teach us a new way. And so yesterday at our Christmas fair, we had a little video from our partners at Orange that help us with our children's curriculum. And the video was like a four and a half minute video of all these little kiddos playing out the story of Christmas in a cold, frigid Georgia winter. As if, 
And they got Mary, and instead of on a donkey, she's on a radio flyer wagon. And the wise men come, and they're pedaling their bicycles with the pegs on it. And they're all partying at the end of the night. And they kept saying, it was the best night ever. The night of Jesus' birth was the best night ever. And to hear these little kiddos say it, and we agree, that was the best night ever. Where God, through Jesus, came into our world and says, there is a new way to live. And so that's what we're celebrating here at Christmas. We kicked it off in big fashion yesterday. We, had, we gave away, I think, about 700 bags to all of the people here coming in from greater Portland, from the community. There was even a, a person from Madison, Maine that came down here and they all got bags with information about Nana's house, Christmas invitations. And so we knew about one in every three people in the family grabbed a bag. So we had over 1,500 people walk through here yesterday during our Christmas fair. So it was a blast. And best news, we were able to raise in, in all of the, the women's ministry, the bake sale, the craft fair, was able to raise just over $4,000 for Nana's house which was fun to help them get kickstarted into the work that they're doing. And so Christmas is a big deal for us, but I pray that we do not miss the reality of why we're here worshiping, singing, come all ye faithful during Christmas time. That will we be counted faithful and will we come yet again to not just that manger scene, but to the Jesus that walked as the rabbi teaching a new way to the cross where he chose to give up his life for you and me into an empty tomb? Will we come as the faithful to encounter this Jesus that we have celebrated for centuries here in this country and somehow some have drifted away to celebrate the season but miss the Christ? And we are on a mission to bring Jesus back into the center of people's lives here in this region in greater Portland. And we got to connect with people yesterday. And we're going to continue connecting with people, inviting them up to our Christmas services, inviting them to coffees, inviting them to dinner on our tables, whatever it takes to bring Jesus back into the lives of humanity. And that's our mission. That's what we're here for. And we're going to see a story in here today from our Quest, our quest series of somebody who heard about this Jesus that had stepped into her life, who desperately just crashed her way into this, this moment that was so scandalous and culturally unordinary. She stepped in because she said, I hear that Jesus has come into my life and I must see him. And this is a person whose past she couldn't get away from, right? Many of us have past that we think we just can't get away from. We can't get away from our, our brokenness, Maybe the mistakes and the regrets that we have, maybe the decisions we've made, maybe the people in our lives have just impacted our life in such a negative way. It's something that's happened to us, not something we've chosen to do, but our past just seems to haunt our lives like this ghost from 20 years ago or yesterday. And so the question today for us to answer is, does my past determine my future? That's what we're going to take a look at. You know, see, when Jesus came as the baby in the manger, all of Israel had looked back at their cyclical past. Well, we come to know who God is yet again. We repent of our sin. We say, oh, Father, we've been sinning against you. We're sorry. They're restored. And then they slowly work their way back to rebellion. Just like that old adage, it takes a generation to build it, a generation to maintain it, and a generation to destroy it. And that's where we see this cycle. And it happens so much in our lives, doesn't it? Where we just look at these cycles that we live through. And are we ever going to have a future that's not defined by our past? And today I wish that I could tell us as, as humans, just not know whether we're Christians or, or not Christians, or we believe in something different than Christianity, just inherently as humans, I wish that I could share data about our ability to move on from our past. Our ability to not let the past determine our future. And sure, there's some stories that are absolutely incredible about people's willpower and resolve to not allow their brokenness to determine their future. But majoritively, we all so easily get trapped in our past. Again, decisions we've made, regrets that we have, things that have happened to us in our past that we might be running for our lives from. We get sucked right back in. And we wonder, is, are we ever going to have a moment where we can say our past doesn't determine our future? 
Because humans are resilient, right? I mean, just 600 years ago, a bunch of people got on a boat and said, I think there's land across this ocean. Let's go check it out. 1,500 miles later, they discover all of North America. Pretty big feat. Would have loved to be on that boat. Maybe the second boat, not the first one. And then just, say, 60 years ago, here we are looking at people landing on the lunar surface for the first time. We've put a bunch of people in a rocket and sent them straight off the surface of the universe and said, I hope they hit that. <laughs> and here they are walking on the moon. And today, we walk around with a device in our pocket that tells us everything and anything that has ever occurred in human history and any knowledge we'd ever want at the click of a button and the type of a Google search. Instant. So we have all of these incredible feats that have come from ingenuity and sheer willpower, and yet most of us, including the astronauts and the people on that boat discovering North America, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, I think that was the boat, I bet their past haunted their future. No matter what we do and what we strive for, our hearts still look at the brokenness of our past and say, I hope that we have a different personal future. It's a sin and a problem as old as the garden where Adam made a decision to take of the apple that Eve gave him, the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and took a bite and his past determined not only his future, but all of our futures. That we would be in rebellion and broken and sin-ridden, looking at our lives and saying, we need a Savior. And people might be visiting us for the first time going, oh no, it's one of those churches, right? We're going to look at a story from the Gospels that turns every one of our realities on its head, including the woman who encountered Jesus and the Pharisee that invited him to dinner. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd encourage you to open up to Luke chapter 7. I know some people go, I'm going to fake that I have a Bible. You can download the app on the App Store. It's East Point. And then in there, you can actually look at the sermon notes that we have going today, just like they're in their, your paper programs. And you can access the scripture and the app with the notes to follow along if that works better. But I encourage you to jump into Luke chapter 7 with us today. And we're going to walk through a story that is so profound. And it had me just heaving, realizing that this is the very same Jesus that's coming to my life. And so I pray it's stark. And it's profound and it's relatable to you today. No matter if you've been following Jesus for decades or today is your first day in church. I hope that God meets you by his spirit through this story. And so we're going to walk through the story starting in verse chapter 36. And I'm going to set the stage for us contextually because I think it's really important. We understand some of the traditions and some of the happenings of the day that help us realize how really culturally stark this moment was. And so in verse 36... Luke records, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And some of us might think, oh, this is a nice gesture. He's coming to have family dinner with a turkey on the table and pull the seat up. Very, very different. The Pharisees dined together in these sort of banquets. And there's many Pharisees. It was an honorary moment. Women weren't allowed at this point to gather in these gatherings to have these dignified elite status dinners that weren't closed doors. They actually loved being watched and, and heralded as these holy men of God. And so they actually left the windows open, the doors open. The whole thing was a spectacle for the public to look upon. Now, I don't know why we humans love just watching elite people just do their thing when we have no business watching. Anybody ever just sit there and tune into C-SPAN and watch this, this whole, all these decision makings? I didn't think so. But we sit there and we watch the Kardashians though. I don't. But we, we just have this inherently in us. We want to see the drama. We want to see somebody say the wrong thing and the other person get mad and, and it just all blow up. And so you can just imagine when all of these Pharisees gather around this table and the windows are open, there's just people packed in going, I wonder what they're saying. I wonder what they're doing. And then the Pharisee invites Jesus to join him for dinner. Jesus, this rebel rabbi that's going around causing issues throughout the entire region, stirring the pot, Jesus shows up at dinner. And you can imagine it's like the big throwdown happening right here in town. And so the Pharisees, some believe to be this innocent invitation. Well, we want to hear about Jesus. Maybe we can reason with him. I think we'll see later on that probably wasn't the motive. 
And so Jesus is reclining at the table. He's not sitting in a lazy boy with his feet up. He's actually laying on the ground, most likely on cushions, at a table that's just six or eight inches off the ground. Right? So they, they lean at the table, their, their head, their shoulders, and their chest kind of pointed to the center of the table while everybody else is circling around it. And so they're, they're reclining in a posture where they're being served and they're, they're able to eat the meal and have a discussion and really dig into each other's lives here. And so this is the setting that Jesus is in while the whole town, imagine the whole town just looking in saying, I wonder what's going to happen. So in verse 37, this is what they did not expect to happen. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. So this dignified dinner where all of the elites, the religious elites are gathering around and they're chumming it up and they're expecting to probably encounter and stir up Jesus a little bit. This woman who lived a sinful life has walked into the room. And most likely the life she's been living is the life of a woman of the night. Prostitution. Her hair is is hanging down. That's not cultural. Using her hair to wipe Jesus's feet is not culturally acceptable. She's got an alabaster jar of perfume around her neck most likely a, a, refreshing, a refreshing substance for the work that she does. And so she's walked into the room and there must be an attention that you could cut with a knife because who is this woman that's come to disrupt our dinner? And she stands at Jesus' feet, back from the table. I'm sure even the hosts and the people looking in upon this banquet dinner are sitting with their jaws on the floor going, Oh my word, did she really just do that? And yet she's not standing there with her arms crossed looking at the table saying, what do you guys think of me? Will you accept me? Her posture is one of broken humility, hoping, praying that this person that she stands before is actually who he says he was. This is a woman whose past has defined her future. Whether it was something that happened to her, which is most likely what happened. Something that happened to her as a young girl that forced her into this line of work or decisions that she's made that she can't get away from. She's caught in this cycle of brokenness and destitution and she just is known in the town with this label. And yet she hears Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to be here. This might be my only chance to get with him to see him, to receive healing from him. This miracle worker rabbi is going to be near enough for me to encounter him. So she's looking in the banquet hall. I'm sure she's saying, there he is. She walks through the door threshold, chest pounding, saying, am I really going to do this? At that threshold, recognizing this is my only chance for my current situation in my past to not define my future and I pray he is who he says he is. And how many of us have been on that threshold wondering, am I making the right decision? Am I going to put my faith in Jesus today with my heart pounding? I don't know what I'm about to do next. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm willing to trust that Jesus is who he says he is. Has anyone ever been there? And how many of us have found Jesus to be so true and faithful to who he is? How many of us know that Jesus is who he says he is, that he brings freedom, that he helps us not have a past that determines our future, but we have a life of freedom in Jesus' name? That's what this woman is hoping for. So, so probably just self-aware that there's so many people looking in on her that are just going to judge her. And she just, all she can do is just look at his feet and wet his feet, his dusty, dirty feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair and pour out the perfume on his feet and just try to do whatever she can to give everything she has to this Jesus. And so the Pharisee who had invited him, we'll find out his name is Simon. He said to himself, this is in verse 39, don't miss that. Simon said to himself, maybe under his breath, maybe in his mind. He said, if this man were a prophet, this Jesus, he would know who was touching him and what kind, what kind of woman 
she is, that she is a sinner. Thinking to himself, he says, Jesus, he's no prophet. If he were a prophet, if he were a holy man, he wouldn't let her touch him. The untouchable, the destitute, the outcast has no business in the presence of God in their minds. That she is a sinner. And many of us would be sitting here going, oh, how dare he? But how many times have we crossed our arms or looked across the room and said, oh, there they are, those sinners. Can you imagine living a life like they do? Imagine running your household like that. You see the way their kids behave? No one has ever said that? I say, can you imagine our kids? They behave like that. And yet, Jesus is being the very Son of God is sitting in the room and Simon doesn't realize at all and hasn't even acknowledged who Jesus is because he doesn't know in his heart. He thinks that his thoughts are his own. No one's going to hear what I think. No one knows the condition of my heart. Newsflash, Jesus is in the room. And if any of us think that the thoughts going on in our mind or the desires in our heart are not seen by anyone, they're seen by the one. He hears our thoughts. He sees the condition of our hearts. That's why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount isn't going after behaviors. He's not saying, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. He, it's all about your heart. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our actions are derived out of the posture of our hearts. And so Simon here is caught in his own sin and he doesn't even realize it. But Jesus helps him see a little clearer. Because in verse 40, it says, Jesus answered him. Jesus answered Simon's thoughts. That's scary. We should ask for Jesus to answer our thoughts, but gently. So Jesus says, Simon, I have something to tell you, right? Asking permission. Hey, can I share something with you? And Simon, still probably not knowing, really has not acknowledged who Jesus is, doesn't know that he read his thoughts. This is what Simon says. Oh, tell me, teacher, you masterful teacher that you claim to be. Jesus says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon, being a logical, educated Pharisee, says, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. And Jesus said, you have judged correctly. We think it was tense before the woman is washing his feet with her hair, tears flowing, heaving, sobbing over the reality that she stands before her Savior. Well, now Jesus is going right after Simon. The tension must have been so thick and palpable. And I just wonder, do you think Simon knew in that moment, had that, rea that realization of, oh no. Where all of us have been in that spot where we think we're so right. We think we're so right. There's no way we could be wrong. And then someone says, hey, that's why you're wrong. And you go, oh no, I miscalculated a bit. Or is Simon just sitting there so blind to his own pride, self-righteousness, and comfort that he's searing back at Jesus saying, what are you even saying? What are you getting at, Jesus? And then Jesus turns the heat up on Simon and the rest of the Pharisees. Jesus turns towards the woman still speaking to Simon. Imagine Jesus leaning at this table. The Pharisees are all around. He's having this dialogue with Simon and he turns and looks at the woman who he knows has been washing his feet. And this is what he says to Simon. Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Hebrew tradition would have been out of just hospitality, having a bucket of water available to wash the dust off anyone's feet, especially a rabbi, to be able to clean him as he comes from a long journey in sandals. He completely ignored any hospitality towards Jesus. Yet this woman, all she had was her tears to wipe his feet. Jesus says, you did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. 
A brotherly embrace would have had also a kiss on each cheek, almost like this brotherhood of Pharisees and Hebrews and people who, who live life together, teaching the people of God. They would embrace each other and it would be customary. Simon didn't do that for Jesus. So we have a new rule going in place at East Point from now on. All of our greeters are trained and equipped to embrace everybody in a brotherly hug and embrace like that. No? We'll start with washing feet or your car out in the parking lot. So Jesus is saying, she's been kissing my feet, Simon. You didn't even embrace me. Like the outcast, instead of shaking a hand and bringing it in, go, oh, there's that guy. Step back. So Jesus already coming into the hot seat, but he turns it around on Simon with this third example. He said, you did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. The anointing of oil on the head of any one person would symbolize royalty. And they didn't even realize that the king was in the room with them. And Jesus is trying to plant the seeds for these Pharisees saying, you don't even know who I am. And yet she took the only thing that she most likely owned of intrinsic value was that perfume in that jar, most likely hanging around her neck. And many of us sit here and say, well, we've given Jesus so much. We're devoted to Jesus. And a lot of us follow the, the historic understanding of a tithe, right? And in, in, in Hebrew culture, a tithe would have been the best and first fruits, 10% roughly of, of all that you have that God has given you, you give back to God. Your best calf or your best sheep or your best crop, there was a full 10% set aside first for God and the rest of the 90% was for them to save and to be able to use for their own well-being. And so today the church has historically taught that we give God 10% of our earnings, of, of what we can give back to God just in devotion of Him. And yet this woman... Did she just give 10% to Jesus? She gave everything she had. The widow's might, everything they had. The person who found the pearl of great price, the gospel of Jesus in a field, sold everything he had so he could buy that field because that held the greatest news he could, he could encounter. And so how about you and how about me? Do we reserve just what we're required for Jesus? Or do we say, you have all of us. You have every resource that we, you have given us is at your disposal, Jesus. And this is what we see with this woman. He says, therefore, because of all of this, because of her devotion to me and recognizing who I am, therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Her many sins have been forgiven. And if we don't think Jesus doesn't see our sins, he does the one full of both truth and grace. Her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. You see her faith in Jesus, when she showed up and devoted and lavished everything upon him, it wasn't to earn his grace. Jesus said, that's her act of love for receiving my forgiveness. Many of us would say, well, let's bring all of the gifts to you, oh God, and hopefully you'll bless me. Jesus is saying, she's giving these gifts because her heart has already been changed because of my forgiveness. Her very walking into my presence because she knew who I was is what brought her the forgiveness in her heart that was so settled and peace-filled, and she knew that her past no longer determined her future. She was forgiven and set free in that moment and her devotion to him resulted in her tears and her brokenness and her com coming completely undone. And how many of us have had an encounter with Jesus to that extent? I pray that every one of us, we don't live on emotions, we don't live on encounters, we don't live on experiences, we live in relationship with Jesus, but Jesus is so personal. If we just ask him, if we just clear our calendar, if we just set aside some time, if we just bring all that we have to him, I promise you, he will encounter you in profound ways. Where you just become so undone at his grace and at his presence and who he is, because that is God's character. And we see all through the scripture, all through his word, when people encounter the grace and mercy of God, they're undone. And yet who still sits most likely with his arms crossed in this story? Simon. The religious leader, 
the one who is supposed to be heralding in the Messiah, the one who's supposed to be telling the people of Israel, he's finally come, he's finally here, he's in my home. He sits there completely in contention with Jesus. I'm sure searing at the fact that Jesus is teaching him a lesson in his own home. And then Jesus does the most profound thing of the entire story. Still staring at this woman, he looks at her, knowing exactly what he's about to do, and says, your sins are forgiven. Imagine this woman just hoping, anticipating that this is Jesus, and the second he says that, completely undone in a whole new way. Imagine looking into the eyes of our Savior, of Jesus, after we've lived these lives of, they could be complete turmoil and destruction, or they could be just sheer apathy, just not caring. And coming into an encounter with Jesus where he looks at us and he says, your sins are forgiven. You're forgiven and set free. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus just stepped on the beehive. Because only God could forgive sins. And they knew that. Jesus knew that. Everybody knew that. And yet Jesus had the boldness to say, your sins are forgiven. Declaring in that moment to anybody listening, I am who I say I am. And in the middle of the hornet's nest, getting all stirred up, the Pharisees, I'm sure, saying, did you hear him? Did you hear what he just said? I can't believe he just said that. That's heresy. We've, we have to stop him. He looks right at this woman. He says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Guess who misses out on the kingdom? The religious people. It's the people who just let down their dignity. It's the people who don't care what people think about them. It's the people who say, I need a savior. I need to experience his grace. I no longer want my past to determine my future and I'm willing to surrender. I'm willing to give everything up. I'm willing to adhere to a new truth in my life and I just want to meet him. And that's our goal, church. That's who we are. We are agents of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's him sitting in the center of the room that we want to introduce people to. The one who says, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And how many of us so desperately want that? How many of us come full encounter with our own past and we say, I want, I will do anything to run away from that. And many of us think of Jesus as this glorified Coast Guardsman, right? We're out there, our boat's taking on water. We're trying to salvage it. We're, we're kind of floating around, or maybe we've bailed into the life raft and we know, okay, I'm in a pretty bad spot, but I just need a little bit of help, right? Maybe we don't owe 500 denarii, maybe it's 50 denarii. We just think, oh, we just need a little rescue and here comes Jesus and he throws us a life preserver. He says, grab it, grab it, swim to it. I'll pull you in, a rescuer Jesus. The gospel tells us that we are already deep at the bottom on the ocean floor. We were dead in our sin. We are dead in our sin apart from Jesus Christ. And he chooses to jump out of the boat, to swim to the depths of our own sin and despair and pick us up and breathe new life into us. That is the gospel we believe. It's not a gospel of works. It's not a gospel of bringing the right perfume or crying enough on his feet or wiping him with our hair. It's a gospel where he says, you can't do anything to deserve my love. I love you because I created you. I loved you because I knew you. I love you and I've come for you. I've become one of you. He left perfect relationship with his father to become flesh, to dwell among us. He became a baby in a manger where kings came from far off lands with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, where women stuck in lifestyles of sin want freedom. And so they bring to him gifts of perfume and tears and yet, what do the religious people do? They say, you think you're God, Jesus? We're going to take care of that. And they thought they were right. They were used to their own rules. They were used to their traditions. And they said, don't disrupt that, Jesus. We're going to warn you. We're going to warn you. Okay, now you're being reckless. And so what do they do? They beat him and whip him instead of kissing him on the cheek. They don't wash his feet. 
They throw him before Pontius Pilate and say, we want him crucified. They spit on him. And instead of anointing his head with oil as the king that he is, they put a crown of thorns on his head. And where the oil is meant to run down over his head and through his beard, instead of oil, it's blood. Those are the gifts that the Pharisees gave Jesus. Those are the gifts that we can give Jesus if we're not careful. When we're apathetic to his gospel, when we choose to understand who he is, but we want to live in our own traditions, in our own comfort, in our own control, we're just saying, Jesus, we're putting you back on the cross every single day. And yet Jesus is saying, don't do it. See this woman who has given me everything she has because of the grace she's encountered. Who are we in this story? Are we the woman that is undone in our brokenness and just wants freedom from our past? Or are we the Pharisees that desire to maintain our comfort and our control? Because I know where I am. I'm the one that looks as people walk in the room and go, oh, still living in that sin lifestyle. They haven't made it yet. I guess Jesus hasn't worked on their life. And as I'm reading through and prepping for this sermon, I'm sitting there saying, who do I want to stand with at the gates of glory looking at Jesus? Do I want to stand with the Pharisee and be in his camp? Or do I stand with that woman who is restored, forgiven, and free before Jesus? I want to stand with her all day long because she knows the grace of the Savior. She knows who Jesus is. And these Pharisees with him right in their living room, in their dining room, missed him. Don't miss Jesus. Don't miss the King who has come. And some believe, and I don't know this, I'm 50-50 on this, some believe that this woman could have been Mary Magdalene. Some, some details point to it's not possible. Other details point to it might be probable. Either way, Mary was also a woman restored by Jesus and who was searching for him and caring for him at the tomb and saw that it was empty. It wasn't the Pharisees. The ones who witnessed the most profound moment in history, the resurrection of Jesus, were the women restored by his grace. And who do we want to be in company with? Who do we believe Jesus truly is? And so today I just wanted to highlight a few points that help us recognize where our heart posture truly is. And before I do, I want to share a passage that Jesus makes very clearly in the end of Matthew to kind of paint the picture that, we don't want to miss out on him. And so in Matthew chapter 21, in verses, uh, verse 31, Jesus says this to the Pharisees, the same group of people. Might have been the same individuals, but it's the same group. He said, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Can you imagine hearing that? For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did, and even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. John was just a messenger, the best messenger of all, but he was just a messenger. He himself said he was not worthy to untie the sandals of Jesus, but God used him as a messenger. I'm a messenger. You all are messengers. We carry this gospel hope within us. And are we choosing to be apathetic and allow the other people who understand his grace, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you? Does that stir up our souls? Does that make us want to lean more into Jesus, understand him more? Because a life, a life like the Pharisees looks a lot like this. The Pharisees live a life of pride and self-righteousness. They live a life of pride and self-righteousness. So thick they can't even see what's going on around them. Putting themselves on a pedestal. Cutting down other people around them to lift themselves up. They live a life of comfort and control. I like my comfort. When it becomes uncomfortable, I'm going to control my circumstances to make it more comfortable. Because at the end of the day, my comfort is my God. Their system, their framework of worshiping God resulted in their status of pride and their comfort and control over a group of people. And finally, 
And this is happening all around us today in this culture. The redefinition of truth. You see, truth is something that is objective. Something that we cannot define. If we can define it and it's different than yours, if my truth is different than yours, it no longer exists as truth. Truth is objective. Truth is given by a third party. Truth was given by God through the breath in Adam's lungs and through his spirit giving us the word. We get to see God's creation. We get to experience his word. And if we're not living in God's word, we are living outside of the truth of God. His words, not mine. And we need to be yielded to the truth. But if we're living in this world where we want to make sure we have comfort and control in our pride, we're going to manipulate the truth to be whatever it makes us, however it makes it, us feel good. And yet a life of freedom, a life of freedom in Jesus, a life where our past no longer determines our future is marked with the opposite. Our past no longer determining our future, that lifestyle looks like a lifestyle of repentance. Daily repentance. I have to live into this just as much as anybody else. That I turn from my own selfishness, my own, my own self-righteousness, my pride, my control, my comfort. Every day turn from that and say, Jesus, I'm living for you. I'm turning around. I'm living a new life of surrender. When we see on t-shirts, Jesus is Lord, that's not just Jesus' friend. That's not Jesus' coach. That's not Jesus' teacher. That's Jesus' Lord. We take him at his word. And finally, we live a life of the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Jesus is the embodiment of the truth that brings freedom to our lives. And does anybody believe that this morning? That it's Jesus' truth that brings us to freedom. And so we get to, to celebrate today as a church family the grace and the mercy that Jesus has. You know, Jesus was reclining at a different table towards the end of his life. A table not filled with Pharisees, but a table filled with sinners, disciples, tax collectors, zealots, broken, busted up people just like you and me. Sitting at his table. And he's preparing them to recognize who he truly is and just as Jesus would, he takes common elements like bread and wine at a dinner table. And he shows them what they are to do going forward. We don't just take communion as a religious exercise. Communion is this moment where we literally commune with God together around his table. And because of his gospel, because of his sacrifice on the cross, we no longer need to come with all of our gifts like the Magi did in the, 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 the early years of Jesus' birth. We don't need to come like the woman to just wash his feet, to be able to just pour out all of our things. We just need to come and believe. As Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Her faith was the belief that he was the son of God. And as the Pharisees offer their gifts of their beatings and their lashings, spitting upon him, crown of thorns, nailing him to a cross, crucifying him, Jesus still said, forgive them, Father. They know not what they've done. He is the perfect embodiment of both grace and truth. So today, if you're willing to step in to a new reality that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the one that's paid the price for me. If you're willing to receive that gift of grace, join me in communion at the table where we take the bread, the broken, broken body of Jesus, broken for you and for me so that we collectively church can be his restored body together. We take the bread. It wasn't a lamb's blood. It wasn't myrrh. It wasn't an alabaster jar full of perfume that cleansed us. It was his blood, the perfect lamb. It was the blood he shed that atones, pays for, washes us clean. Our past no longer determining our future.
because of the price that he paid for us. So we take the blood, we take the wine, we take the juice in remembrance of him. So this morning, you may be really wrestling with some things. Saying, I don't know, am I the Pharisee in this story? Am I the the woman? Should I be the other? Here's my question for you. Do you believe Jesus when he says, I am the Son of God? If you've never contemplated that in your heart, if you've never recognized Jesus came for me. The love of the Father is for every single person in this room, and he sent his son for you. And I don't say collectively us, I say every single person here for you. And Jesus invites us, when we accept his grace, with him and his Father in paradise. And so if you haven't received him ever in your life or you need to return back to him and you need to have that moment where you don't care who's watching, what's happening, and you just need to come into the embrace of somebody who may be just one step ahead of you, who's saying, follow me as I follow Jesus. We're gonna have people here in front of the stage, be pastors, prayer team members, anybody. Don't go after a certain individual. Just go to someone who's willing to embrace you. Because we as a body want to celebrate what God's doing and we don't want to be the Pharisees who sit there with our arms crossed and say, Jesus, if you only knew who they were, you wouldn't accept them. And he says, if you only knew who I was, you would. And that's the invitation he has for us. It's countercultural. It's good news. And we will receive you today. And for church, church, those of you that are saying, hey, I'm just loving my life with Jesus, press in. Press into him, worship him, give all of yourself over to him because he is so faithful to give so much more. So let me pray for us as we worship. Feel free to come down and just receive, if anything, just an embrace from Jesus. Father, we thank you so much that your son lives and dwells within us as we obey your word. We thank you that your gospel is our only hope, that you rescued us from our pits of despair and gave us a new song in our mouth, a new hymn of praise, new breath in our lungs. You revived our dead spirit and gave us a new one to live a life for you. Thank you for every single man, woman, child in this room. Thank you for their hearts. You've come for every single one of us. And would we recognize that your love is personal. Your son Jesus is relational. And we can not only have an encounter with you, but walk in relationship with him. Would you revive our hearts this morning? Would you draw us near? We we live lives of complete surrender, lives of humility and repentance, and a life seeking your truth above all else. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship together.
receive you. He's waiting for you to run to him. So if you feel him calling you deeper to him, run, run to him. There's freedom and healing and life found in Jesus. And if you need prayer, don't be ashamed. There's power in prayer. Let's worship him. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry and these bones will sing. Father, we just come before you, whether we've come down this morning or we are sitting in our seats, we pray that we recognize who your son Jesus is in our lives. We pray, Father, that your son just becomes more and more of the light he's meant to, to just illuminate the darkness of our lives, to cast away the, the past that we've had and then set, us face, set our faces like flint towards your kingdom of freedom. That Jesus, that you set us free so that we might do the same for others. And Father, I pray for a church that's resolved and resilient, that understands the gospel and that shares it with every person. We come in contact as you would lead us, Jesus. You build your church. We don't build this church. You build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Father, we trust you. We trust that you send us on mission that we'll see hearts and minds and souls return to you where you just have your arms open and you say, welcome home. Father, please pour out your spirit. Give us wisdom. Lead us into those pastures. Help us find rest for our souls. And may we invite others to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we are so grateful for you. But know that this is not just about a Sunday experience. We are a movement inviting other people into relationship with Jesus, where he encounters us, we're encouraged and convicted by him, but he leads us into a community to say, we have met the Savior. And it's our role as a church family to continue sharing the gospel in relationship with this greater Portland region and show them that we are for them in Jesus. And so thank you for being a part. Merry Christmas and may this season not be one where we just let it fly by with consumerism and busyness, but that we recognize that Jesus has come to dwell among us. And we get to share that good news this Christmas. So we love you. Be well. And we'll see you next week. And God bless. In Jesus' name.